an indie set. There are so many messages, a lifetime of messages. She knows all of them by heart. It has been a fun life. I am tired now and I'm ready to go. You can only do so much with this body. It's time to shed this body and fly. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, friend. I'm Bolly Jacobson, and today on Dog Cancer Answers, we have a special episode. Back in 2021, we spoke with Dr. Janet Patterson Kane of the Morris Animal Foundation about their Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Today, we are getting a look at what it is like for dog lovers who participate in this study and how the study can shape the lives of both the Goldens and the humans who adore them. We have two guests, Dr. Mike Lappin, who has several patients enrolled in the study, and Kim Perry, who will share the true tale of her golden, Indy. Indy was golden hero number 123, and both his time in the study and his cancer diagnosis have been a catalyst for progress in dog cancer research. This is a long episode, but it's well worth it. Grab a snack and maybe a few tissues because you might need them. So joining us today for our true tale of Indy is Kim Perry, Indy's mom, and Dr. Mike Lappin. And I'm going to have Kim introduce Dr. Mike, because Kim, you said this beautiful, before he joined us on the call today, you introduced him in this most beautiful way. Tell me about your experience with Dr. Mike Lappin. Well, I first met Dr. Mike because the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study that we're both involved in does a secret Santa every year. And my first meeting with Dr. Mike was he was my secret Santa. And there was a photo of Indy that I had taken at a dock diving event. And he, I'm looking up at it now with his, (laughs) and his bumper. It's in my room where all my ribbons and photos of my dogs are. And so I got that as a secret Santa gift and that sparked our friendship. But then when Indy was diagnosed with lymphoma in the spring of 21, Dr. Mike helped me with his connections and things like that. And he was an integral part of the team, I will say, that helped with his cancer, you know, diagnosis and treatments and, you know, just thought processes and just getting insight because lymphoma is not one of the cancers, although the most treatable cancer, not one of that I've experienced and not one that I actually ever want to go through again if I can help it. But Dr. Mike was coming to Phoenix because he's a big Eagles fan and he and his wife follow the Eagles. I call them affectionately groupies. 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 Yes. Um, <laughs> and they were coming the end of September to see the Eagles. And I actually got to meet Dr. Lappin in person at that time. But I know in my heart, and I told him this, that Indy waited until he could see Dr. Lappin before he passed away and before he told me it was time for him to leave. That's so beautiful. Dr. Lappin, you are in the Boston area. You're down in in the Buzzards Bay area for Cape Cod. Cape Cod. Yeah. And your relationship to the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study is you contribute to it. You help to run it. There's all sorts of involvement in there. Can you tell me a little bit about your involvement in the study? Yes. As a a study veterinarian, I started off with 17 heroes in my group which ended up being the most the most of any veterinarian in the country. Oh, my. I wasn't shooting for that. I just wanted to get all my friends who had golden retrievers involved and get them into the, the study, especially once the group had come out to Massachusetts to put on a presentation while they were recruiting. And I went to that, and I talked to Dr. Mike Guy, who was then the, the lead veterinarian, and decided at that time that, you know, I wanted to get as many of my clients who had Goldens involved in the study as I could. So we just started enrolling them as I came across them. I talked to them about it. But not only am I a study veterinarian, but I also have a hero in the group too. So one of my own dogs is is one of the heroes. And heroes are what you call the dogs who are enrolled in this. It's called a lifetime study because it starts at the beginning of life. It's looking at Goldens over the course of their entire lifetime, correct? Correct. The initial study enrolled dogs that were between six months and two years of age until they filled with 3,000 dogs. And now some of those dogs are 
12. Most of them are 8, 9, 10. But there's a few dogs that were initially enrolled in the study that are 12. So they're, you know, the, the guide mark. I mean, these dogs get old for a reason. And that's what we're trying to find out. Trying to find out what is extending life. And by looking at thousands of dogs of the same breed, so you're looking at a smaller genetic pool than the wider population, you can learn a lot by eliminating all of those other genetic factors, right? About what works, maybe what's not so helpful for life longevity. Right. Initially, the study was going to be set up to stop when they reached... 500 dogs of the four major cancer types that we're studying, and that being hemangiosarcoma and lymphoma and mast cell tumor and um, osteosarcoma. Mm -hmm. But recently, in the last few months, they've decided to continue the study past the endpoint until all of the heroes have passed. Oh, wonderful. So it's an extension it's an extension of the initial study. Yeah, really. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yes. So what prompted that decision? I think some of it was prompted by the fact that, like I said before, these older dogs get old and stay healthy for a reason. Right. And what we're trying to do is think about what's in their genetic profile that's different. Why do they survive when so many of the others pass away? Mm-hmm. Now, do you think there's also a difference in, because I imagine that everybody's feeding their dogs a little bit differently. Some dogs get more or less exercise, Some, you know, like different environments they're living in. You're tracking all of that as well. Yes. Yeah, they have, they have so many different data points on things like what heartworm medication you use, what flea and tick medication you use. Is your dog primarily on grass when it goes outside or is it on bare ground? Do they go in the woods? You know, even down to things like what kind of dish do you feed your dog in? Is it glass? Is it plastic? Is it metal? Right. So they're they're collecting all of these data points and now are utilizing all the data points that they have to have researchers come and use those data points to try to put things together and maybe get some ideas of what may cause or not cause things to happen. So it's spurring other trials, I imagine, and also maybe giving some really concrete, actionable items for veterinarians like yourself to pass on to dog owners. Right. Okay. Can we talk a little bit about what you personally have learned and what the studies learned so far over the course of this study? I also want to talk about Indy, of course. Yes. But this is definitely something we want to talk about in this show, and so it would be really great. What have you learned as a veterinarian so far? from your participation? Well, things that we've learned, you know, to go back to like non-cancer stuff is one of the big things was early spay-neuter and determining whether there were things that happened or didn't happen when dogs were spayed or neutered before age of maturity and basically found out, yes, there are some problems that can occur In Goldens, we find a higher incidence of osteosarcoma and hemangiosarcoma in older dogs that have been spayed or neutered before the year of age. We also find increased incidence of hip dysplasia, cruciate ligament disease, orthopedic disorders as a result of them having altered growth rates. Because when they spay or neuter them before their bone plates close, those have the tendency to grow bigger. So you get a dog that looks like a like a dragster. Oh. With a you know, a higher rear end. So it throws their whole throws their whole balance off of how the joints come together, the angles that they have, and causes problems with the way that they're supposed to be versus the altered way. I see. So that is a very important finding and I know when, you know, this was suspected for a long time, mm-hmm. but it was sort of unorthodox. And there were a lot of people who just thought, no, early spay and neuter is important for population control and all of the reasons it is important. But these health consequences were sort of dismissed for a while. But we now know that on a statistical basis, these things are correlated right. to those early spay and neuter. Right. So when do you recommend a spay or neuter happen based on what you've found out? My personal recommendations are for males, if they're not causing issues with aggression or 
being a total dork is to leave them intact. <laughs> You know, okay. I mean, I've had a number of intact males together at my house, and they get along fine. That's a matter of training in the mo- for the most part. You do run into some dogs that are aggressive towards other dogs or towards people. Those dogs should be neutered. But we generally recommend a minimum of 18 months of age. Mm-hmm. Females, it goes a little differently because you've got a female cycling, and we know from research that the more times that they cycle, the higher the incidences of mammary cancer. Right. So, you know, there's two thoughts about that. One, mammary cancer is something that most of the time you can reset and do a, a mastectomy and get away from it. Mm-hmm. Some types are highly malignant. Right. And we don't know until we take them off, which they are. But we know that the more times they go through a season, the more chance they have of developing that. Right. Also, leaving them intact has a greater risk of developing pyometra, which is a uterine infection, as they get older. And oftentimes, those end up in emergency situations right. that require emergency surgery. They can be treated medically if the dogs are not really awful sick, but the propensity is there for them to develop it because they're still intact and they're still going to cycle. Dogs do not go through a menopause like female humans do. So they never stop cycling. It'll become erratic as they get older. But I've seen dogs that are cycling 10, 12 years of age. Mm -hmm. And some of them are lucky and don't have any mammary cancer. Others are not so lucky. But minimum age for a female, I generally recommend them going through at least one season, preferably two or three. Mm -hmm. My own personal experience with my own dogs is I have them go through three cycles before I spay them. That seems very reasonable. So they get to become an adult, right. a real woman. <laughs> they get to mature. They get that hormone flush that closes those bone plates and finishes off their growth phase. Right. And then we can eliminate the reproductive cycle. And you can do the sterilization. Do the sterilization. Right. And then you're reducing the risk of mammary cancer later on. Right. Yeah. My understanding is that after the sixth cycle, the risk is sort of locked in. Like you can reduce risk up until the sixth cycle. It starts and then... to go up after the third cycle. Yeah. And kind of maximizes when you get out about six. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you don't really change the risk after that point. Right. Spain after the third cycle for you yeah. makes sense because it, right. they're adults and that's where their risk for mammary cancer is lowest and you sort of lock them in at that risk level. Right. Very helpful. Is there anything else that you've learned over the course of the lifetime study that you want to share with our audience? Well, we've learned that cancer is awful and it's heartbreaking and it's tragic and we want to get rid of it. And, and, you know, we're just, you know, we've all been affected by it. You know, I've had dogs with pretty much every form of cancer that there is, but the breed you love is one that you have to realize that those risks are there when you get one of these puppies. Because you don't know how long you're going to have them. But realizing that, the study has shown us a lot of data points that will help into the future to help determine. We just have to go through and find out the important parts of them. And that's what's being done now. Okay. So other concrete points are still being looked at. Right now, we know for sure that early spay and neuter is something to reconsider or to consider very carefully on an individual dog. Yeah. So helpful. So when you met Kim's dog, Indy, it sounds like it was later in life, but where do you remember coming into Indy's story? Well, like Kim said, you know, we, we kind of got acquainted when I saw this picture on her website of Indy with a bumper in his mouth and, you know, after dock diving and swimming through the water. And I just thought it was a really awesome picture. She was my secret Santa recipient that year. And I had just bought a large format color photo printer. Uh Aha. And I said, "Uh (laughs) aha. I get to play with my toy. (laughs) I get to play with my toy. So so I had to I had to get a little help from the elves that they have helping out to get, you know, a good size file so I could put this on like a thirteen by sixteen print. Mm Mm-hmm. And then framed it and sent it to her. Wonderful. 
Wonderful. And that year I, I was one of the elves and helping with Secret Santa, and I had no idea <laughs> that Dr. Mike was um, my Secret Santa until I opened it. So, Oh, that is so sweet. But we also did other things together, like, you know, secretly on Facebook Messenger, if I have a question, I'd say, sorry to bother you, but... Um, so we struck up a friendship and had yes. conversations, you know, outside and just ask questions that way. And then in 2019, when I came to my first Golden Retriever National, Dr. Mike was doing the samples there that he does at the National. And we met in person at that time as well. Wonderful. So Dr. Mike, you collect the samples are the DNA samples that you collect to right. help with. So tell me a little bit about that work. That is separate from the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. Right. But the Golden Retriever Club of America was approached in 2005 by OFA, Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, about helping to start a DNA repository basically a bank where you can submit, put in DNA samples, and then those samples become available for researchers to use for studies that OFA approves of. So we were one of three breeds that agreed to help OFA start this just as a project to see how it would work and the logistics. So in 2005 at the Golden Retriever National Specialty Show, we set up a collection clinic to collect DNA samples from dogs. And with the help of the Golden Retriever Foundation, we made it possible for those samples to be collected for free. So it was like, okay, here's a free opportunity to put this DNA in, in a bank. So we did that. Eddie Zook, who's the CEO at OFA, actually came to Gettysburg, where we were having the show, and helped out. And we collected 600 dogs in three days and collected their DNA and sent it back. And that was the start of, of the OFA DNA bank. That's a lot of DNA. Yeah. As of now, we have, I think we're over 6,000 samples now. We've been doing it every year at the national specialty. And then some of the regional specialties will also offer that. And individual clubs, if they're doing a health clinic, can also offer that. And we subsidize it through the Golden Retriever Foundation. So the cost to the owners is zero. And really the only expenses are for the club to ship the samples out to OFA and then find somebody to draw the blood samples. The more DNA that we have in these banks, the more studies, the more science can be done years later. Right. The big thing about having the DNA in a bank is that a lot of research projects prior to that point each researcher would have to go out, recruit his own samples. And you might get a dog that's, you know, giving to this sample and that sample. And it takes time, especially in breeds of dogs that are pretty rare. And there's not many individuals to collect samples for certain studies, where by doing a bank, we can put the DNA in the bank. It's there. It's probably, for the most part, what we give them is endless. They're not going to run out. And they can release samples that have been there for years and be able to release a sample for testing that might only be a few months old. That's something new. So that you can take some of these dogs that may have been dead 10 or 20 years now and be able to test those dogs for certain diseases to try and trace things along. Yeah, so it really helps to shorten that timeline so that the from the idea and saying, I have an idea for a study, I have to recruit, then I have to set up all of those steps. That first part can sometimes really hold things up if you right. can't get a large enough sample right. size. And what a, large what enough. OFA does is they have a little survey that they do with each sample and ask the owners to say, you know, does your have dog have this disease, this disease or, you know, problem or, or condition? so that they can be able to selectively pick samples and say, okay, I need 400 golden retriever samples with hypothyroidism oh, wow. as a base. And they can just pull out those it. samples and just ignore the other ones. Wow. This is wonderful. Yeah. So the, the satisfaction as a dog lover that I get is that this isn't directly helping my dog, but it's helping who knows how many dogs in the future. 
and people too, as well, you know, with diseases. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, given that the pedigrees are tightly aligned, when you look at golden retrievers and the breeding programs, you know, just as as an example, my current male wave, my adult, he goes back to very old lines. And so you can look up those, you know, five generation pedigrees on a database that's called canine data. And there are other breeds that use canine data as well. But for golden retrievers, you know, that's part of the research too, to look at the DNA and use those samples and genetic disorders. And it comes in also in alignment, you know, with breeding, you know, for hemangio, you know, what lines are more prevalent to hemangio? There are certain lines that are, you see it in the dogs, uh, generation after generation. So having those DNA samples you know, you can help a host of different dogs. Right. This is really wonderful work. How can people find you, Dr. Mike, so you can take their dog's DNA? Well, basically, when we do a clinic, we'll set up a clinic and publicize the clinic through like the premium list for the national specialty and things like that so that people are aware of we're having a mass collection clinic. Mm -hmm. People can have their dog's DNA submitted to OFA it's a $20 charge to have a blood sample submitted. And their own veterinarian can draw the blood and they can send it in through the U.S. mail. Okay. So it's something that if you go to the OFACHIC.org. We'll put the link on our show notes. Yeah. yeah. You can find out information about the DNA repository. You can get an application from them and have your, your vet draw the blood and send it in. Okay. Is the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study still recruiting dogs as well? No. The Lifetime Study closed, I don't remember the exact year, but like eight years ago, closed to enrollment when we got to a total of 3,044 dogs. Right. That's a lot of dogs. Yeah. How many of those dogs are still with us? Well, as of last night... They have breaking they have, news. They have a website <laughs> actually that updates daily. Oh, okay. With the um, the study enrollments, and currently, out of the initial three thousand and forty four, there are eighteen hundred and fifty one dogs alive and still enrolled. They have seven hundred and twenty dogs that have passed away. Okay. There's 351 dogs that are inactive and 122 dogs that were withdrawn from the study. Okay. And most of the withdrawns were people, they, you know, after they got into it and they didn't have the time or they didn't want to take the time for stuff, or in some cases, dogs that had started out, say, with a breeder were placed with a new owner and they decided not to continue. I see. But that's a pretty low number, 122 out of 3,000. Absolutely. Because it does take a bit of involvement. Kim, why don't you talk a little bit or tell us what it's like to be a mom of a dog in the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study? I always dreaded the annual questionnaire um, <laughs> because of the fact, I mean, they've simplified it greatly. You know, they've done a good job in, in simplifying it for owners. But, you know, I got Indy at eight weeks old. I was involved in rescue and after my first male, that's how I came to love the males in the breed because they're more Velcro-y than the females. The boys are like, you want to do it this way? You want to do it this way? You want to do it this way? Okay, okay, okay. And the girls are like, you want me to do what? <laughs> <laughs> so after my first male passed away and he was a rescue, I decided that I wanted to know what I was getting. And I sought out breeders locally and went through the local club here, the breed club here, the Valley del Sol Golden Retriever Club. I interviewed them and they interviewed me and I was supposed to get a dog from a, another breeder, but I needed a male and the likelihood of a male coming, because there was only two, maybe two, maybe three, were slimmer. And then Indy's breeder finally called me one day and said, I can't remember if I contacted you, you know, Gina's pregnant, the mother, and there's 10. She said, are you still interested? And I said, absolutely. So... Indy was born on March 2nd of 2011, and he was known as Big Blue. When he came home, he was 15 pounds. And <laughs> initially, I was looking for a therapy dog because that's what my other male was. But 
somebody that I know said, you know, you'd look really cute running around the ring in a suit with your hair in a bun. And so he opened my <laughs> eyes and to a whole different world, including the club, whereas one person who does advertisements for the Golden Retriever News, the GR News, she talked about the study and the recruitment, and this is before it opened. And so I was piqued. My interest was piqued because all of my dogs had died of, you know, one type of cancer or another prior to Indy, and there were four of them. So I wanted to make a difference. Um, I'm kind of an outlier as an owner. I'm not your average show dog owner. I thought we could provide diversity to the study. I'm a raw feeder. I've been, you know, feeding raw for about 20 years. I'm a minimalist in, in vaccines and things like that. So as an owner, I was really excited, you know, to be part of the study. And we actually tried to get into the pilot program. And there were so many people at that time trying to get into the study when it opened that we couldn't even get into the website. So how you know a dog is an older dog in the study other than their birth date is by their hero number. And so Indy's hero number was hero number 123. And so I think a lot of people remembered that because it was an easy number to remember too, other than, you know, all the things that we did. So, you know, we did the annual study, you know, the questionnaire, and it took forever to fill out because of all the things I do do, you know, and where my dogs sleep and the bowls that I feed from and, you know, all the supplements, I had to go put them all on the counter you know, in order to, or take a picture of them in order to be able to fill out the study. It took me about two or three days before I couldn't do it all at one sitting. It's like 10 pages, right, Dr. Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Which cookies did you give and how many hours apart were they? Yeah. Um, this is over the course of a year. So you're looking back over the previous year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a lot of memory work. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that, you know, I have another friend who dropped out particularly for that reason was that the just the the survey was just so time consuming mm -hmm. and she didn't change her regimen from year to year but they wouldn't allow you to say you did the same thing as last year take the same information you had to fill it all out over and over again yeah well they wanted to make sure you were doing the memory work right. so that if something different happened yep. you would be able to record that yeah right rather than come back later and say oops i forgot i changed this Right. But it is a time commitment for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else did you have to do to be in the study? Um, we had to find a veterinarian that was willing to be part of the study, like Dr. Mike. And my veterinarian here, Dr. Ferguson, I've known her for probably 20 years. We pretty much go by first name like I do with Dr. Mike. And she was, you know, interested in helping. And I can remember like the first time that she did the study visit it took like an entire day for her because it was a long process. They have to collect nails. And then she complained because he was a show dog that his nails were too short. So she couldn't get clippings. She couldn't clip them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and fecal and urine samples and hair samples. And I was very particular because I didn't want him shaved because he was a show dog. And just inputting the data on their side you know, was very laborious. So I think Dr. Mike would agree it's more streamlined now, but it still takes a bit of time. Yeah. In the beginning, the owner survey was taking five, six hours, probably total. And our veterinary survey after the exam was probably taking an hour, hour and a half for each dog. Now we've gone to a much more streamlined setup and the veterinary survey now I can probably finish in 15 minutes unless we have a whole bunch of new lumps or something to report. Okay. So that sounds much more helpful. Yeah. I imagine technology has been an aid as it's yeah. developed over the decades. Yeah. In the beginning, Morris had the um, data set all being done by an outside facility. Mm -hmm. You know, and we kept talking to him about this is just way too hard for the owners. It's just time consuming. Why can't they just put in a check mark and say, this is the same as it was last year. And they did a bunch of data work and then brought everything in-house. And that's when they started to streamline things. And it's gotten much better since then. Oh, that's nice. So these visits, was it once a year? Was it every six months? It's once a year that we would go. I mean, and, 
you know, when we were originally accepted into this study, you know, they hadn't obviously reached their 3,000 number yet. And staff of Morris has changed over the years. But I think one of the things that I could say about this study is that are, there are people in the 48 contiguous states that I will never meet like I'm looking at you today, Molly. Mm -hmm. I've had the pleasure and I'm grateful for my friendship with Dr. Mike. And I've had that opportunity to meet him and, you know, his wife and their friends. But we call ourselves a family and we say that we're 3,000 strong. Mm -hmm. And part of the impact that I was alluding to before that I didn't know that I had or Indy had until he passed away was that, you know, when I posted about, you know, losing him, people said to me that, sorry, this part is hard, um, that I joined the study because of you. Oh. Because I helped recruit. Locally, I held an event here in Phoenix at the company that I was working for at the time and recruited people. And, you know, some of those people are local and I'm friends with them. But if it was not for the study, I would never know them. I would never know that they have golden retrievers. And we call ourselves a family, and we are. We cheer, you know, wave my current male, is a support, known as a supporter. And so is his son, Cruiser. And we cheer those triumphs that we have and, you know, our successes for those that do competitive dog sports. We cheer us on. And even those like Pam Van Meter, ben, Dr. Mike, Bentley, um, Bentley yeah. he's a dog that will, I think will make an impact for years to come after he passes because every morning his mom in the winter, and they think they live in Wisconsin or Minnesota, Bentley loves to slide down the hill in their backyard on his back <laughs> in the winter. And every single day she he's goes a slalom out. dog. Yeah, he's a slalom dog. And she goes and takes a video and she posts it on our page. We have a Facebook page that's private for 3,000 family members. And we have multiple Facebook pages. We have the 3,000 Strong page. We have the 3,000 Hearts page. And we have the Embrace 3000 page on Facebook. And those are for people involved in the study. Hearts is where they do the cards, right, Dr. Mike? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So they send out cards. They have these comfort blankets. And they're laced with what we call GMFs, which are known as golden magical fibers. For somebody who has had a cancer diagnosis themselves or their husband is ill and people you know, that are owners in the study, they contribute to those banks to be able to make those. And like at the National in 2019, I collected GMFs and I sent them to somebody who is now a friend of mine. We talk almost every day and she lives in North Dakota and her name is Janelle Bogner. And she helps with those blankets. And then when a dog passes, she sends, if she has GMFs, she sends those GMFs in a card to the owner so they have that. So the impact of the study to an owner is just more than just having a dog and being part of a study. It's about being part of a family and having a connection because it's just, it's not just a dog. You know, these dogs are our lives and they bring joy and they bring heartbreak and sorrow along with that joy. Mm -hmm. But I never knew the impact that Indy had and the breadth and depth that he had until he passed away. And the people that followed us, I taught a dog in Arizona how to surf. And we competed in Imperial Beach three years in a row. And people followed our story. I posted every day when we went to California, up and coming to, you know, the surfing competition. And people watched us and they cheered us on. And, you know, helped recruit dogs for the study. I was even asked at the five-year anniversary to participate in that celebration. And Indy flew with me in the cabin, and I organized a dock diving event for all the people that came to that celebration. That was my day. That was what I did. And we got to meet people from all over the country, and we celebrated not only these friendships that we made, but these dogs and these dogs' lives. 
like Kathy Blimline, right? Dr. Mike mm-hmm. and Mark Blimline. I met them at the five year celebration and their dog Gideon, he's gone to the national and now he's uh, you know, got hunting titles and he's got rally titles and he's got agility titles. I would have never met her if it's not for the study. So we keep close knit. We're a family. That's what we say. We're 3000 strong. And in fact, I wore my Morris Animal Foundation yeah. Golden oh, Retriever Lifetime, yeah. you know, um, yes. it's a sweatshirt your, your today. Sweatshirt. Um, yeah, <laughs> on purpose. It. We do fundraising <laughs> every year. They do ornaments and things like that. So I, even though my Indy is gone, our saying in the study is once a hero, always a hero hmm. to the point that the Golden Retriever Club of America, the GRCA, recognizes that. And when each dog passes, they send the owner a certificate. I think it's a certificate of achievement, right, Dr. Mike, Mm -hmm. for participating (laughs) in this study that is a groundbreaking. It's the only study of its kind that is a longitudinal study, and I think in the world. And it's, it's a groundbreaking study. And to be part of that and to make a difference in that For me, as I believe strongly in philanthropy, and that is a big part of who I am and my makeup, Mm -hmm. is, you know, being philanthropic. And Indy will make a difference for the rest of not only my life, but many generations to come. And to say that I was part of that gives me great pride, and I'm very grateful. It's an amazing, amazing effort and study and I'm so glad to talk to the two of you. We've talked to people from Morris about the study before, but I'm not sure we've quite tapped into this deep vein of love and trust Mm -hmm. that this study has built. I have to ask you a clarifying question. Are golden magical fibers hair? Yes. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Yeah. That's beautiful. (sighs) We collect the ones that don't turn up under the beds as dust bunnies. Right. (laughs) And send those in. Yeah. So that we can share our golden magical fibers with other people. Mm -hmm. So they can have some of the magic. Yeah. That makes sense to me. I'm sort of a small breed person. I've always had smaller breeds. But there's definitely magic in a golden's fur. Anybody who's ever seen a golden walking by in the sunlight knows that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. We're going to take a short break to hear from our sponsors. And when we return, I want to talk about Indy's cancer diagnosis and how being a part of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study affected that part of your journey. As we talk about every week here on Dog Cancer Answers, there is a lot of advice out there for dog cancer. Everyone is always hoping for something new and fantastic. Obviously, we are too, or we wouldn't do this show. But the things that actually have benefit tend to stick around over time. They don't come and go like fads. For advice that is tried and true, has helped hundreds of thousands of dogs, for that kind of advice, you should turn to the Dog Cancer Survival Guide. The book is chock full of information about conventional treatments. It includes insights that your vet may not have time to share with you. It covers the most reliably helpful and safe supplements that you can use with your dog. Supplements that generally can be used on their own, but also with conventional treatments. The book covers diet in detail, so you can really understand how what you feed is helping your dog. And it goes over mindset and lifestyle changes that will help you and your dog with quality of life. You can get the Dog Cancer Survival Guide everywhere the books are sold, and at dogcancerbook.com. We're back with Kim Perry, mom to Indy the Golden, and Dr. Mike Lappin. So tell me a little bit about Indy, Kim, and about Indy's illness when he was diagnosed. How did that change for you? How did being a participant in the study change when he got the cancer that the study is focusing on trying to understand better? Well, you know, in the beginning, I was trying to figure out what was going on with him. There were a couple of things that were just off. Like, I never knew lymphoma could affect the eyes. Mm -hmm. And looking back retrospectively, you know, and thinking back, um, hindsight being 2020, you know, I had asked a couple of people, like, because Indy was never 
I don't strike my dogs at all, you know. And so he grew up in a household where he was loved, and Indy was larger than life. I, I'm sure Dr. Mike would say that even when he met him in September His of last year. His nickname as an infant was Big Blue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he much preferred humans to other dogs, and he made that known mm -hmm. with the people that he surrounded himself with. But early on, before we actually got the diagnosis, I noticed like when I went to raise my hand towards his face, he would squint. Hmm. And I, I thought maybe something was wrong with his vision, but hindsight being 2020 again, that was the lymphoma. And I, I didn't know that. And I talked to our ophthalmologist at, you know, when we were trying to figure everything out. And in Arizona, valley fever is something that's endemic to the state, the southwestern United States. And so there is another study that Indy and WAVE are part of called the Canine Valley Fever Project. And so we would run the Valley Fever profile twice a year. But I'm because I know the people that run that study, I talked to them and asked them if I could run a full blood panel. You do that annually, but because Indy was in the study, he actually had that through, you know, the Golden Retriever Lifetime study. So I asked them for special permission to do that. And then lo and behold, his lymphocyte count was elevated to around 12,000, where a normal is around 1,000 to 5,000 at the highest level. And that's when I reached out to Dr. Mike and Dr. Ferguson, my vet, called me. And then we got in to see our oncologist and per, you know, Dr. Mike's urging and then trying to figure out what was going on. So fortunately, because of the study and because of, you know, the local breed club here and Dr. Ferguson and just knowing people, I was in the right time at the right place because unfortunately, we only have two oncologists in the entire Phoenix metro area. One of them you probably have heard of, Molly, is Dr. Betsy Hershey. Yes. And she um, she has to pick and choose who she can see because of all the cancer that runs in dogs. But I know her office manager. She's a member of our club. I've known her through rescue. And we were able to get in within two days. And so they... Um, <laughs> it's good I was to know people. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, my, <laughs> grandfather, my grandfather mm -hmm. always said, it's never what you know. It's always who you know. Who you know. Who you know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm Sicilian. So I think that's very apropos in, in yeah. my culture. <laughs> um, so we got in and they did some more testing and... I don't know, Dr. Mike, did we do the biopsy first or we contacted Morris, you know, to do, we did a fineal aspirate and then we did right. a larger biopsy to determine. And we sent the, you know, the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study equips study participants, owners with two boxes, one for a biopsy kit and one for a necropsy kit. And so those biopsies are paid for by the foundation so I took the, the biopsy kit to Dr. Ferguson. They sent in a sample, and then they did a number of testing, and then Dr. Hershey did additional testing. And initially, the diagnosis came back as uh, aggressive T-cell lymphoma. And I think there was, Dr. Mike, if you remember, I think there was an aspect of leukemia, or we weren't sure. At that time. Yeah, because his lymphocyte count went up to like 50,000 or so, as I recall, mm. or his white, total white count was elevated. So we were concerned about possibility of leukemia as well as lymphoma because he had, to, uh, had started to get his lymph nodes enlarged. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was where the fine needle aspirations came from. But because there was also the potential there for leukemia and Part of the problem when you have a dog that shows these signs is you don't really know whether they have one disease or two diseases that are concurrent. And knowing that would help you to decide what kind of treatments. Right. And also prognosis, like what, what right. we're looking prognosis, at. Prognosis, probably more than treatment. Because mm -hmm. for the most part, treatment of lymphoma is very similar for all the different forms of it. Right. But, you know, if you've got a dog that develops a leukemia, that can be much more serious because it can progress much more rapidly. Yeah. So, you know, between my holistic vet, Dr. Ferguson, Dr. Mike, and Dr. Mike put me in touch with Dr. Modiano at University of Minnesota. He connected us. 
and Dr. Jarvis, who's our canine conditioning coach, but she did general practice. It was a village and, you know, everybody opined and, and they only wanted the best. They had Indy's best interest at a heart. And so Indy did not present like a normal T-cell lymphoma. What's what's normal? <laughs> yeah. I would say typical. Typical. Yes. Okay. Typical T-cell. So we decided after talking to Dr. Modiano to do additional testing and they did another type of biopsy. And they sent that to Dr. Moore at UC Davis. So when originally Indy was treated with, you know, what's considered the gold standard, which is the CHOP protocol. Mm -hmm. And his numbers did drop. But then not long into the diagnosis, because of the biopsy they did, and because he didn't present as a typical lymphoma case, they opted to change the diagnosis to indolent. T zone lymphoma. And I was like, okay, if I have to have cancer, I'll take this over anything. That's you know. a better type to have. Yeah, that's a better type. And so it's much slower. Right. So they initially started him on PRED. We did three treatments of the CHOP protocol. And before we got to the doxorubicin, the fourth one, then they changed the chemo protocol to chlorambucil. Okay. And that was because of the change in diagnosis. Yes. Yeah. And okay. then. During that time, Indy did respond, you know, his numbers dropped, but he never, we never were able to get him to drop enough where he was considered in remission. So initial diagnosis was April, May timeframe, you know, June, July, his numbers dropped with the chloroambucil. And then in August, they spiked again. And yeah, August, September, in the meantime, I also sought other modalities of treatment. I talked to a gentleman by the name of Charles Lozo. He has a company called Right Ratio. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before, but they custom develop a formula that's combined with, you know, the medicinal properties of THC and CBD that are specific to each dog. And when then we saw his numbers drop again, and then in September, after we did the testing, the numbers went up. You know, they raised a little bit and in August, and then the numbers went up in September. And, you know, during that time, Indy and I, I in some ways, I'm so grateful for COVID because I, I well, now I'm full-time remote with the company that I work for. But if it wasn't for COVID, I wouldn't have been able to do all the things that I did for Indy because I would have had to be in the office. But I was home with him full time and he required a lot of care. There were a lot more supplements, you know, because of my holistic vet, because I do both Eastern and Western medicine. Um, the Dr. Mike mm -hmm. knows that. I'm mm -hmm. not your average show dog owner again. So I did everything that I could do and tried everything to find, you know, that I could help him. The outcome is still the same, you know, but it's not about quantity. It's about quality. And I wanted him to live his best life for how long, ever long he chose to be here. And through the guidance of my holistic veterinarian, you know, he and I had many conversations. And I told him many times to help me help him because I knew that he would stay for me. He was just that dog. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That he would stay because of me. Mm -hmm. And so I had to tell him to tell me when it was time and that it's okay that I would be sad, but when it was time for him to leave, he needed to help me so that I could help him make, you know, with that decision. And this was a conversation you were having with your veterinarian or with Indy? With Indy. With Indy. Yeah, with yeah. Indy. So I've had that conversation with my dogs too. Like mm -hmm. you're going to be the one in charge of this and right. Yeah. You really have to tell me. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. And Dr. Mike told me that he was coming in September. They actually were here for the Eagles concert. And I kept telling my other friend who lives in Maine, who's also a holistic veterinarian, and she can communicate to animals. And I kept telling her, I just have this feeling that he's waiting for Dr. Mike. And sure enough, I mean, when you saw him, right, Dr. Mike, you were surprised. Yep. How well he looked that day. Yeah. And he expected a lot worse. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I saw him, he was animated, he was pumped up, 
I don't think it was just because we were there, but you know, he was he was like, oh boy, visitors. <laughs> yeah. Um, after the diagnosis, you know, that when August when they changed it back to T cell and not indolent lymphoma, Doctor Hershey then changed his protocol to CCNU, and then in September when his numbers climbed again, you know, I knew it was time. You know, I knew it was time that I would be doing it not for Indy. I would be doing it for me and for everything that Indy gave me, that wouldn't be fair. You know, I couldn't ask him to stay. And as hard as that was, it was the right decision. And I don't have any regrets about anything that I ever did. The world that he introduced me to, you know, the Golden Retriever Club, being able to go to the National in 2019, you know, Wave showed at the National. He was in Best of Breed. And, you know, I hadn't shown Indy for a while. And I showed him in Veterans that day. And it didn't care if we didn't win. You know, it wasn't about that. It was about the relationship. It was about the journey. And, you know, the impact, again, that we had on the study and people recruiting the magazines and the articles they wrote about us, you know, when they were recruiting and things like that. And the applause that he got as a veteran, you know, at the Golden Retriever National. And then Dr. Mike took his samples that day, his DNA samples and the photos, you know, we have thousands of photos. So, you know, I couldn't ask him to stay any longer and he said he was done. And I told Dr. Hershey, I said she wanted to do another protocol. And I said, no, I said, I can't, it's not fair to Indy, you know? And so I made arrangements after Dr. Mike left, you know, that weekend and, and we had another hero owner, my friend Winnie and her dog, Gracie, who's also well known in the study. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Jarvis came over and it was Dr. Mike, his wife and their friend. And we had dinner at my house and they got, Winnie brought all of her dogs. And then we had Indian wave and we took pictures and we got Dr. Mike's favorite pie (laughs) and we had dinner at my house and, you know, we laughed and we celebrated and we talked about the study and we got to meet, you know, put faces together. And that's, you know, again, what the study is about. It's about the people and not just the dogs. And, the following week, you know, when I got that news, um, I called my friends and they came over and they, you know, we did some Reiki with Indy and, you know, they got to say goodbye and he got to say goodbye to the people that he loved as well. And um, I talked to my friend, Dr. Ruth, and I asked her to ask Indy if there was anything else that he needed from me the night before I, I let him go home. And so she told me that she talked to him and she said, she asked him if he had any messages for me. And Indy said, there are so many messages, a lifetime of messages. She knows all of them by heart. It has been a fun life. I am tired now and I'm ready to go. You can only do so much with this body. It's time to shed this body and fly. So, You know, my holistic vet came and she did the spirit journey and we had a a veterinarian come to the home because Dr. Ferguson wasn't able to do it that day. And Dr. Jarvis, who my dogs, you know, if something happens to me, that's where my dogs go. And because she'd never done anything like this with a dog in her life, you know, we started with her when she was just starting her canine rehab and conditioning business, getting away from general practice. She was there, you know, and we were all there when we released Indy and it was remarkable, you know, the, the things that transpired in the next few days. And, you know, when I see him now, you know, I, cause I do, I, you know, I feel his presence. Um, he comes either in the form of a hummingbird or a butterfly. (laughs) So it's incredible. The impact one dog can make on your life. Yep. And then you have this family to go with it who mourns your loss like you do. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) We're all going to just, you know, sob for a few minutes. (laughs) Um, And, uh, and I'm sure that 
our listeners will as well, because I think anybody listening knows the depth that a dog can go to in a heart of a human. But that I think, um, well, for me, the reason that I do this work and that my husband does the work he does is because we've seen that humans become their best selves when they pay attention to their dogs. Mm -hmm. And so your story is so illustrative of that, of how paying close attention to a dog and the golden retriever lifetime study. One of the reasons I've always been very interested in it is because it does the same thing. It pays close attention. It says these dogs are important and they're going to tell us a lot. And even on a scientific level, they do, because not only are they telling us about dogs, about golden retrievers, but about humans, because the medicine for humans and dogs is so similar in so many ways. And so dogs just give and give and give. They do. (laughs) And when when we give back to them, we receive, I think, not just dog love, but human love. And it's Mm -hmm. very beautiful. And I just appreciate uh, your story so much. And Dr. Lappin, your part in it and your part in the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study and also your work with the DNA Repository is just so important. And none of us will ever know the true impact. Right. And I've had a number of, of other clubs that have come and asked for advice on how to set one of these clinics up at their nationals because they may not have a foundation like we have at the Golden Retriever Club and trying to piece things together to get their breed involved as well. Yeah, you know, and the Indies legacy lives on not only through the study, but through the work that I'm doing now and trying to make a difference and make sure that, you know, his life is memorialized. Um You know, I talked to Pet DX, which I know that you guys have talked to as well, and I've talked to Dr. Mike about it, and I talked to the head of clinical research there and asked because I saw saw a post on our Facebook page about somebody who's in the GRLS study and that also is in the Pet DX study, and I said, Mm -hmm. I private messaged her and I said, how did you know about that? How do you get involved? And because I want to make a difference, you know, for not just for my dog. It's somewhat somewhat selfish, okay? I'll be really honest and real about it. It's somewhat selfish because I want to know. I want to know to be proactive, to get out ahead of something. You know, there are many times I look at my, I've looked at my dogs through the years and I'm on my seventh golden retriever and said, are you hiding something on me? You know, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Are you hiding something and are you hiding something? Yeah. Yeah, Like, so um, she talked to me about the study. And so I reached out to Pet DX and talked to them. And I asked if they had a study site for their onco canine cancer testing. For their testing. Yeah. For their cancer test. Yeah. Here in Phoenix. Which they're still developing. Right. Right. And so I said, you know, how do I get this test? Because I have a six year old and I just lost my 10 years and seven months to the day. Of, from lymphoma, and he was part of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. How do I get involved? And she's like, we don't have a study clinic in Phoenix. And I said, well, what if I can get you one? Yeah. <laughs> and I know some people. I know some people. Yes, right. There you go. <laughs> and I talked to Dr. Ferguson and Wave, you know, my current dog. He will be the first dog enrolled in the study site in Phoenix and his test is a week from today. Wonderful. So you got the trial site for Onco Canine in the Phoenix area. Mm-hmm, I did. So the listeners, if you're in the Phoenix area. I'm helping to recruit yeah. dogs. You have an Onco Canine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Reach out to Kit Berry. We'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> I told Dr. Ferguson I'd help her recruit dogs, and I probably have already four or five dogs. And, you know, some are involved in the study and there are others that have just dogs that are of age and actually Wave's brother who lives in Las Vegas who I met his owner through the study the Golden Retriever Lifetime study just had the onco canine test and forwarded me his results which are clear at this time because we all know those tests are a point in time right but in the hopes that we can use the brothers 
as data, you know, for Petty X to study pedigrees, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and things like that. It goes back to the lines. So her name is Deb Pietro and she helped me, you know, she said, do you want me to send you the information when I get it for Armani? And I said, sure. And so Dr. Ferguson said that would be great. And the benefit to that would be that they get to follow the brothers. And, you know, as an owner to be part of this study, it's, you know, I, I don't have to pay for the test that's performed, but I do have to pay for a blood draw and an exam. And I know they're very stringent in how the clinic has to operate. And that's why Dr. Ferguson has agreed to use WAVE as her test case, Mm -hmm. you know, so she can work through those kinks. And again, it's about helping other dogs, right? You know, in this case, it can be any breed. It can be a mixed breed. They just have to have certain criteria, like no ear infections or, you know, inflammation and, if they're a pure breed, they have to be of a specific age. If they're not one of the breeds that are prone to cancer, like Golden's, like Wave is of the perfect age. He's six. Mm-hmm. And his constitution is way different than Indy's. So, you know, I always thought Indy would be here till he was 14. And sadly, that wasn't the case. You know, I used to tell one of the other admins in the study that he and I had a pact. He's not going anywhere until he was 14 and he had other plants. So (laughs) that brings up something I was wondering about. I mean, Kim, you still want to participate in these studies. Dr. Lappin, do you feel the same way? Would you do something like the golden retriever lifetime study again? If somebody came and said, in a minute, yeah, in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's about paying it forward, not only about the research and stuff like that, but, you know, we have people that are members of our Golden Retriever Club locally that don't show or they're interested in showing. And so I try to mentor and help those people based on what I know. And I mean, I'm in my spare time, I'm studying to do animal acupressure oh. and I'll have my master Reiki next month and then I'll continue on. So when I retire, I can have something else to do. (laughs) Retire from one job to go into another profession. Yeah. Reinvent myself. Yes. Sounds like it. Setting yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. That's wonderful. So, but it's about helping and paying it forward. And that's, that's what I'm really want to do is to make a difference and to leave a legacy and to continue Indy's legacy. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing what you've done. And I would like to just highlight before we wrap up one part of your story that we haven't really delved too deeply on. But one of the reasons you're so involved with people is because of your training. And I think that when you participate in any kind of dog training, you're bonding deeply with your dog, but also with other people. By nature, you have to consult with others. So can you talk a little bit Kim about that. I think a lot of people feel like when they get their dog gets cancer, their their life is almost over and they just kind of shrink their world, but you open up. Can you talk about that for our listeners? Yeah, sure. So, you know, it started with Indy and, you know, having had rescue dogs and the training that I did, my perspective on having a dog is that they have potential and it's my role and my responsibility to help them reach their potential. And training is not just going to PetSmart and there's nothing wrong with doing the training classes at PetSmart or any other place. It's not six weeks. It's the rest of the dog's life, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's important because not only does it stimulate their bodies, but it stimulates their brain and you build a bond that is really hard to break and you become reliant on each other. And it's a partnership. And I compete in many sports. Indy competed in surfing, as I mentioned. He was my first show dog and everybody has a learning dog. And all the mistakes that I made with him, I tried not to make with Wave. And now the mistakes that I made with Wave, I'll try not to make with Cruiser. (laughs) (laughs) And we do a CGC testing and we do scent work and we've done barn hunt and we've done rally and we've done obedience. And it enriches not only just my life, because the dog world is very, very small 
but it's very, very big at the same time. And I wouldn't have known or met any of the people that I've met if it wasn't for Indy. And he opened my eyes to a world that's greater than my own. And like, even in what I'm doing with my acupressure, I was asked to help my friend's neighbor's dog just this past weekend. And the dog serves as an emotional support animal for both her and her husband who suffer from PTSD. And you can see the dog has no release for itself. The dog is always on. And I talked to her about like just doing like a licky mat. So he gets that satiation, you know, of using his brain, a snuffle mat to hide his treats and playing hide and seek something other than helping them because he has no emotional outlet for himself Mm -hmm. doing a treadmill, you know, taking a training class. And she says, well, he knows sitting down. And I said, well, there's way more than that, you know, to training a dog. And the average person doesn't necessarily think in that way. And it's, I don't think you form as great of a bond. And I know Dr. Mike can comment on that because we both do scent work and, I've kind of resigned myself that I'm going to retire away from the show ring, except for maybe in veterans when he's of the age and let him do, he's earned the right. He's almost a grand champion and he's earned that right to choose what sports he wants to do. And his loves are dock diving and scent work. And I almost do a face plant because he gets so excited about starting at the start line when he does scent work. And Dr. Mike has seen my videos We do classes once a week, and now Cruiser will start puppy classes, and then we'll do handling classes, and I basically live for my dogs. (laughs) I I, I work for them, not for me. I think Dr. Mike agrees. That's probably why he still has his clinic. Yes. We, We work so our dogs can have fun. Right. Right. Work for their quality of life. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we always say when we increase our dog's quality of life, we're by definition increasing our own quality of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, people that don't have animals or don't think the way that we do collectively, they don't understand. And it's always about the dog and, or it's just a dog. And what they don't get is that there are a million of us in the world We just kind of like are the, you know, in the closet, (laughs) so to speak, because unless you live in our world, you don't know it. Like the person that I was talking about just a few minutes ago, she didn't know that there were, there was fitness equipment for dogs or there were treadmills for dogs. My guest room has Waves treadmill. It's eight feet long. It sits in the guest room so he can run. And in the summertime, especially because we can't walk here or, you know, we, we have places to mm, swim. It's too hot. Yeah, it's too hot right. to run them on the pavement. Mm-hmm. So <sighs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you to both of you. Really appreciate you being here, Dr. Mike Lappin. And thanks for having us. Kim Perry. I'm very grateful to be part of this. And thank you as well for including both of us. Our pleasure. And thank you, listener. Dogs like Indy change our lives. They certainly change the lives of we humans who love them, but they can also encourage us to expand our horizons and try new things. Indy brought Kim into the world of dog shows and the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, but he also inspired her to help more people and dogs access studies and emerging technology that help the dogs of the future lead longer and better lives. And because of comparative oncology, where what happens in canine cancer can help inform what happens in human cancer and vice versa, who knows how many dogs and humans Indy will eventually help through Kim. The show notes are quite full this week with all of the links and resources that Kim and Dr. Mike mentioned for both golden retrievers, but also any other dog. You can see those in your podcast app or on our website at dogcancer.com. Please share this episode with anyone you know as a golden and share our podcast with anyone who has a dog with cancer and needs hope or some help. I'm Molly Jacobson. And from all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcancer.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200.
And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network. 